Good morning, Mace. Today's scripture reading can be found in the book of Daniel, first chapter. You can follow along on page 690 in your pew Bible. In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. And the Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand with some of the vessels of the house of God. And he brought them to the land of Shinar, to the house of his God, and placed the vessels in the treasury of his God. Then the king commanded Ashpenaz, his chief eunuch, to bring some of the people of Israel, both of the royal family and of the nobility, youths without blemish, of good appearance and skillful in all wisdom, endowed with knowledge, understanding, learning, and competent to stand in the king's palace, and to teach them the literature and the language of the Chaldeans. The king assigned them a daily portion of the food that the king ate and of the wine that he drank. They were to be educated for three years, and at the end of that time, they were to stand before the king. Among these were Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah of the tribe of Judah. And the chief of the eunuchs gave them names. Daniel he called Belteshazzar, Hananiah he called Shadrach, Mishael he called Meshach, and Azariah he called Abednego. But Daniel resolved that he would not defile himself with the king's food or with the wine that he drank. Therefore, he asked the chief of the eunuchs to allow him not to defile himself. And God gave Daniel favor and compassion in the sight of the chief of the eunuchs. And the chief of the eunuchs said to Daniel, I fear my lord, the king, who assigned your food and your drink, for why should he see that you were in worse condition than the youths who are of your own age? So would you endanger my head with the king? Then Daniel said to the steward, whom the chief of the eunuchs had assigned over Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, test your servants for ten days. Let us be given vegetables to eat and water to drink. Then let our appearance and the appearance of the youths who eat the king's food be observed by you and deal with your servants according to what you see. So he listened to them in this matter and tested them for ten days. At the end of ten days, it was seen that they were better in appearance and fatter in flesh than all the youths who ate the king's food. So the steward took away their food and the wine they were to drink and gave them vegetables. As for these four youths, God gave them learning and skill in literature and wisdom, and Daniel had understanding in all vision and dreams. At the end of the time, when the king had commanded that they should be brought in, the chief of the eunuchs brought them in before Nebuchadnezzar, and the king spoke with them, and among all of them, none was found like Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Therefore, they stood before the king. And in every matter of wisdom and understanding about which the king inquired of them, he found them ten times better than all the magicians and enchanters that were in all his kingdom. And Daniel was there until the first year of King Cyrus. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Corey. Good morning again. Again, my name is Forrest. I'm one of the pastors here. Good to be with you. Excited about starting this series. I don't know what you think when you think of the book of Daniel. What kind of impulses come to mind? Maybe you think confusing visions. Maybe you think books about how to eat the way God wants us to eat. Um, if you're familiar, there's an entire book written about sort of the fasting from the king's food and eating vegetables and water, that that's how God wants us to eat. None of that is what Daniel is about. <laughs> Daniel is laid out with uh, essentially six stories that take place in the court of Babylon and then four visions. We're going to be walking through those over the next ten weeks and we're going to begin to hear a theme emerge. And this morning we want to lay the foundation for the book of Daniel. And it's there present in chapter 1. In 1951, psychologist Solomon Ash conducted what was called, what he called the conformity line experiment. Some of the psychologists, counselors in our midst may be familiar with it. Apparently it's a big deal. The participants were given a line judgment task. 
this is what they were shown. They were shown a target line, which is on the left, and then three more comparison lines. And the participants had to state which comparison line, A, B, or C, was most like the target line. It wasn't a trick question at all. So what's the answer? One, two, three. All right. We got it. Seven participants were put into a room and were to give their answer out loud, one at a time, in order for everyone in the room to hear. But six of the participants were plants who purposely gave the wrong answer. The person who was not a plant sat at the end of the row and gave their answer last. They did this with 50 participants. And the study found that 75% of the time, the, the real participants, the, one who, the ones who did not know, who weren't in on it, conformed to the other participants' answer, ultimately giving the wrong answer to an obvious question, 75% of the time. The study shows the incredible power of the social pressure to conform. We all feel that and experience that in life, don't we? That no matter what sort of uh, world we're in or categories of, of work we find ourselves in, that there is a, a pressure to conform. And we feel it in particular ways as the people of God to conform more broadly to the world around us. The storyline of Scripture is that God's people have always had to navigate cultural pressure to conform to the empire they find themselves a part of. And most often, God's people have been a minority culture within a broader culture. This has been true of God's people throughout history. So here's the tension God's people have always felt that the book of Daniel speaks to. We as God's people have primary allegiance to God's kingdom, yet we live in a world governed by other kingdoms and there is pressure from those kingdoms for our allegiance as well. And this tension can feel confusing. It can feel hopeless at times. Daniel is a book that speaks strong hope and wisdom to God's people. It reminds us that God's people are being sustained by God's presence as they live their lives in Babylon. So before we pray, this is where we're headed this morning. The first thing we're going to answer is what's with Babylon? What do we mean by Babylon? What does scripture mean by Babylon? And then we're going to look at hope in Babylon and wisdom in Babylon. And this will lay the foundation as we begin to work our way through the book. Let's pray this morning. God, thank you for your presence with us. Thank you that you never leave us, you never forsake us. And thank you that you are our source and sustenance in the midst of life in Babylon. You're with us, God, and you give us hope that is sure, and you give us wisdom that is comforting. You're with us. May we as your people remain faithful in the midst of the world, we ask in Christ's name. Amen. So what's with Babylon? What do we, what do we mean by Babylon? The book of Daniel opens up with a clash of kings and a clash of kingdoms. That is Ultimately, we see underneath it a clash of cultures. Look at verses 1 and 2. In the third year of the reign of, king of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. And the Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand with some of the vessels of the house of God. And he brought them to the land of Shinar, to the house of his God. And placed the vessels in the treasury of his God. 
King Jehoiakim was Israel's 19th king after King David. And he did what many kings in Israel did. He led Israel not into faithfulness, but into unfaithfulness. In the book of Deuteronomy, we see that God told Israel that if they were not faithful to this covenant, to God and his ways, that he would send them into exile. And to go into exile is to, to essentially be without a home, to be removed from your homeland and put into another land. And what we read in Daniel is God, and in those first two verses, is God bringing about what he said he would do. That God's people were unfaithful, and God followed through on his promise and brought them into Babylon. In the ancient Near East, there's another layer here. In the ancient Near East, if one king conquered another... It was not just a military victory, it was also a religious one. They saw that our gods have conquered your, usually gods, in this case with Israel, God. The fact that Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Bab Babylon, took vessels or furnishings, it was essentially furnishings of the temple, took vessels from Israel's place of worship and place those vessels in the land of Babylon was seen as the Babylonian gods defeating the God of Israel. All onlookers would have seen this. Now imagine the angst. Imagine the angst that this would have brought about for the Israelites. It looked to the world and the narrative of the world was that Israel's God has lost. The gods of Babylon are more powerful than the God of Israel. Imagine that would have, what that might have done inwardly to the people of Israel. These vessels then, or these furnishings, were brought from Israel's house of worship to a particular place, a very significant place in the biblical storyline. The land of Shinar, we're, we're told in verse 2. Shinar first appears in the Bible in Genesis chapter 11, which is also where we find the beginnings of Babylon. In Genesis 11, 1 through 9, humanity comes together, some of you might remember, to build the city of Babel, specifically the Tower of Babel, in the land of Shinar, we're told. And with the purpose of elevating themselves to the place of God. And God knows that this will be disastrous for humanity. So God comes down in judgment and confuses their language and scatters them throughout the land, graciously disrupting their project. And from that point on in Scripture... Babylon becomes not only a real city, it is spoken of as a real city at times, but it becomes an image that represents humanity's corporate rebellion against the God of Israel, the one true God. We see this even into the New Testament. For example, 1 Peter 5.13, Peter writes, and he's writing about the church, and he says, she who is at ba Babylon sends you greetings. But when he writes this, he's nowhere near Babylon. He's actually in Rome. And what he's doing is essentially calling Rome the new Babylon, speaking symbolically of Rome's culture that is doing just as Babel did, that is seeking to elevate itself to the place of God. Its emperors, Rome's emperors were seen as deities. We also see this in Revelation 17 where Babylon is called Babylon the Great, the mother of earth's abominations. It's a pretty big title, right? Again, Babylon there is an image of empire, empires that oppose God's ways. So Babylon in scripture and specifically in Daniel, it does refer to a specific kingdom 
headed by Nebuchadnezzar in the 6th century BC, located in what is modern day Iraq. But Babylon also in scripture represents a spiritual power at work in every kingdom that is not the kingdom of God. In every age, on every continent of the earth. So Babylon, then, is any kingdom since the Tower of Babel whose values and ethics are contrasted or opposed to God's kingdom, which is indicative of their desire for independence from God. All of that is tied up in Babylon. To live then as God's people in Babylon, you can see where pressure for conformity is always at play. Now, our knee-jerk reaction is, is no, no conformity. And in some sense, yes. But in another sense, no, there has to be some level of conformity to life in Babylon. Maybe a better word would be assimilation to life in the midst of Babylon. We see this pressure, and we'll get to the assimilation in a moment, but we see this, this assimilation and we see this pressure in verses 3 through 7. Let's read that real quick. Then the king commanded Ashpenaz, his chief eunuch, to bring some of the people of Israel, both of the royal family and of the nobility, Youths without blemish, of good appearance, and skillful in all wisdom. You're starting to see some of the values of Babylon coming to the surface. Endowed with knowledge, understanding, learning, and competent to stand in the king's palace. And to teach them the literature and language of the Chaldeans. The king assigned them a daily portion of the food that the king ate and of the wine that he drank. They were to be educated for three years, and at the end of that time, they were to stand before the king. Among these were Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah of the tribe of Judah. And the chief of the eunuchs gave them names. Daniel he called Belteshazzar. Hananiah he called Shadrach. Mishael he called Meshach. And Azariah he called Abednego. So notice what they do here. Notice the assimilation that begins to happen as they are taken into the land of Babylon. They said yes to learning the language and the literature of the Babylonians. They said yes to being a part of the politics of Babylon. They said yes to taking on Babylonian names. Does that unsettle us at all? There is a really strong no coming. We're getting to that. But we need to see that there was some level of assimilation to life in Babylon. You might remember, we've talked quite a bit as a church about this particular verse. Remember what the prophet Jeremiah tells God's people to do when they get to Babylon. If you remember in Jeremiah 29 verses 5 through 7. Of this moment. When they come into Babylon, he tells them, build houses and settle down, plant gardens and eat what they produce, marry and have sons and daughters, find wives for your sons and give your daughters in marriage so that they too may have sons and daughters. Increase in number there, do not decrease. Also, seek the peace and prosperity of the city, Babylon, to which I have carried you into exile. Pray to the Lord for it, because if it prospers, you too will prosper. In other words, as you are carried into Babylon, my people, God says, be fully present there. Be fully present in the midst of Babylon. We all know the scripture Jeremiah 29, 11, right? Every graduation has had that scripture. Every Christian school graduation, I should say, has had this. We've used it in various ways. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you, not to harm you, plans to give you a hope and a future. You know what that was about? Babylon. 
I have a future for you in Babylon. I have plans for you in Babylon. I have a hope for you in Babylon. It's about life in Babylon. Now I know some people may theologically disagree with that, this next statement, and that's okay. You can be wrong. It's all right. Not a problem. The call is not to make Babylon Jerusalem. The call is to make Jerusalem present in the midst of Babylon. There are moments and places in the history of God's people where Jerusalem overtakes Babylon. Those are the great exceptions. And if I'm honest, things get really weird when that happens. Just look up. Constantine, weird. Most of us in this room live and work in Babylon, in school systems, in hospitals, in local governments, in tech companies, in corporations, and perhaps mom and pop shops in the midst of the city. And the question Daniel asks us first is, are we fully present in the midst of them? Are we bringing Jerusalem to bear in those places? We see in our text that Daniel and his friends excelled in their study of literature and wisdom. They stood out in their engagement with Babylon. They excelled. I remember we used to, a Bible college I went to decades ago, they used to send in, uh, Sears had a big warehouse, and they used to send um, a representative at the beginning of each semester that literally would offer a job to anyone that wanted one. And someone asked him, why do you come here? And he says, because Bible college students are better workers than most of the other people I hire. And I thought, that's, a, that's, that's being fully present in Babylon, right? That is excelling in the midst of what we put our hands to in the midst of Babylon. That's the way it should be. We may be greatly unsettled by what's happening in our culture. I don't know what your narrative is about culture. I used to think I knew generally what Christians thought about culture. I have no idea anymore. We have, you know, 250 people here. There's probably 250 narratives about what's happening in the culture. But I'll say this. We may be greatly unsettled by what's happening culturally. And and we should be unsettled by much of what's happening culturally. Nevertheless... We are called to be fully present in it, to bring Jerusalem to bear in the midst of it. But we can only do that, we can only do that if we are people who live with deep hope and wisdom in the midst of Babylon. We must have deep abiding hope in the midst of of a culture of chaos. And we must know that God is the fountain of wisdom and will give it to us in the midst of that chaos if we're going to be faithful in Babylon. Hope that says no matter what we see, God is in control and wisdom to know where to conform and where to resist. So let's look first at where we see hope in the text and how that hope comes to bear. So it looks on the surface, we've said, as if Israel and their God has been defeated. But if you look closely, the text reinterprets that. And it shows us that things are not as they seem in Babylon. Three times it's mentioned that God gave. Verse 2, and the Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand, into Nebuchadnezzar's hand. 
verse 9, God gave Daniel favor and compassion with the chief eunuch. Verse 17, God gave them learning and skill in all literature and wisdom. God gave. First, the Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand. This was not a defeat of Jerusalem by the gods of Babylon. This was the hand of God doing what he said he would do if his people were unfaithful. The Lord gave Jehoiakim over to Babylon. This is the Lord doing just as he said he would. In Deuteronomy, as we mentioned, he told Israel, this would happen. Be faithful to me. But if you're not, if you're unfaithful, I will send you into exile. But we see, as we just saw, that even in the midst of exile, I have a plan for you there. I have a hope and a future for you there. You are there with purpose, redemptive purpose, and so it is with us. Whatever we think that's happening in the culture, God has us where we are with purpose. Christians in California, what are we doing, right? Christians in the midst of, of what many people would say is just, you know, waiting for the giant earthquake to hit and for California to go off into the ocean. Like, what are you guys doing there? Well, by God's grace, bringing Jerusalem into Babylon. Besides, California is beautiful. I don't know if you guys have noticed that. Like, and God has millions of believers in the midst of California. God has called us here with purpose. We've already mentioned the link of Shinar with Babylon. And Daniel and his friends have a particular mental link in their minds. Think about it. As they go into the land, they know the history of this land of Shinar. As they're carried away into exile, they go with a narrative into exile. And what is that narrative? They know that ultimately... In the land of Shinar, oh, this is the place where God came in judgment upon Babel. This is the place where Babylon is defeated for their pride. This is the land we're coming into. This is the history of this land. It is not that Babylon has triumphed. This is the land in which our God has triumphed. So as they are taken as captives into the land, they go with a deep hope. They know the story of the land. And they know the God who is over the land. They know that things are not as they seem. Though the world may be reading the circumstances as the defeat of Yahweh, they know better. They go with a narrative of hope. They know that their God has not been defeated and he will not be defeated. And as we look on, it appears as though the God of Israel has been defeated by the God of, Babylon's, of Babylon as the vessels of the temple in Jerusalem are placed in the land of Shinar. But in truth, those sacred vessels of the temple have just been temporarily relocated to Shinar because God, the God of history, is in control. One commentator writes, the author of Daniel calls to mind this story of the beginning of Shinar because in the pages that follow, he will tell the story of Babylon's end in similar fashion. This is the hope of God's people. This is the hope of our life in Babylon, Babylon that is woven throughout the book of Daniel. This was the hope of Daniel and his friends. Their God was not defeated, and he would not be defeated. He would be with them in Babylon. This is the hope that gives them strength in the midst of Babylon. And if we look closely, we see that things are not as they appear. The Lord is at work. And so it is with our time. Christians in America, 
in Southern California in the Inland Empire, things are not as they seem, not as they appear. God is at work. A major theme of the book of Daniel is that the kingdoms of this world will become the kingdom of our God, and God never loses that plot line. He never has, and he never will. Babylon's end is sure. The Lord is at work in your life and in mine, and through his people, the church. And we may not feel that, but we can know that. The Lord gives hope to his people in Babylon. And the Lord gives wisdom to his people in Babylon. Wisdom in Babylon. Daniel comes to the forefront in verse 8. Up to this point, it looks like he has just been conforming to Babylon. That's all he's done is assimilated scenes. He's brought into the king's court. He's been taught Babylon's ways. He's been trained in their wisdom. He's had his name changed. He's been served the king's food. And here... When it comes to the king's food, emboldened by hope, Daniel resists. He says, I'm not going to eat of the king's food. He refuses to conform. In verse 8, Daniel resolved that he would not defile himself. Now there's debate around what this means. What does it mean that he would not defile himself? Why draw the line here after all of these other things that have taken place. So what we know, at least, is that partaking of the king's food would have defiled him in some sense, but it doesn't seem that it was a matter of what they were feeding him. It seems that it was a matter of who was feeding him. The issue was one of trust for sustenance. Daniel's resistance was about who was going to be the source of his life in Babylon. Listen to what theologian Trimper Longman says about this. Their minds and their being, Daniel and his friends, their minds as well as their bodies are being fed by the Babylonian court. If they prosper, then to whom would they attribute their development and success? The Babylonians. However, by refusing to eat the food of the king, they know it is not the king who is responsible for the fact that they looked healthier and better nourished than any of the young men who ate the royal food. Their robust appearance, usually attained by a rich fare of meats and wine, is miraculously achieved through a diet of vegetables. Only God could have done it. The vegetarians are like, hold on, there's... It's a way to be healthy and just eat vegetables. Anyway, it's not the point. Daniel's resistance was less about making a cultural stand and more about the, a decision to trust. While in Babylon, he's saying, I will remember who the real source of my life is. My conformity will not be mean will not mean losing my identity i belong to god and he is my source of life it's not the king's power or the king's food or the king's favor it is the lord and think of this every time a meal was served to him he was reminded of his source of life and hope in Babylon. That though they had no choice but to take up residence in Babylon, they would remember that they were being sustained and cared for by their God. Daniel then, from that point, has to figure out how to do this. This is where we see the wisdom of God come in. Daniel then goes to the chief of the eunuchs to work this out, But the chief of the eunuchs is afraid. He's afraid of what this will mean for him. So Daniel goes to the steward who is directly over him and his friends, and he works out a deal. He says, give me 10 days to eat like this. And if I end up emaciated and you're going to end up in trouble, 
then do what you need to do. But can we try this for 10 days and see what the result will be? And at the end of 10 days, verse 15 says they were better in appearance than the rest. This is the wisdom of life in Babylon. See, wisdom in Babylon is finding a way to live out our kingdom ethics in the midst of the pressures of Babylon. It's resistance through wisdom. There's a reason we have an entire book of wisdom and many portions of wisdom throughout Scripture because life is not always black and white. In fact, most of the time, life is not black and white. Most of the time, it's an issue of wisdom, and so it is with life in Babylon. It's complex. We're bringing Jerusalem to bear in Babylon. How do we do that? We can only do that well. We can only do that faithfully by wisdom. How do I navigate my workplace, my neighborhood? How do I navigate where I live in the world? How do I navigate my government? How do I resist what I need to resist? And how do I do it with wisdom? Daniel found a way to do the right thing in the right way. And God gave him the wisdom to do it. And he will give us the wisdom to do it as well. It's interesting that the three God gave statements that we looked at earlier correlate to specific powers of Babylon. They are set over and against specific powers of Babylon that we tend to look to and trust in when we're in the midst of Babylon. And it seems that this is very intentional. intentional. In verse 2, God gave Jehoiakim over to Babylon, and he wants us to see that God gave them over. It was not the military might of Babylon. In verse 9, God gave Daniel favor with the chief eunuch. It was not the political power of Babylon that gave Daniel favor. God gave learning and skill in verse 17. It was not the teachers and wisdom of Babylon that ultimately gave Daniel and his friends the wisdom, the learning, and the skill for life in Babylon. So we see set over and against, God gave over and against three powers of Jerusalem, or excuse me, three powers of Babylon that we tend to trust in when we find ourselves in the midst of Babylon. Military might, political power, and human wisdom and cunning. And we are meant to see that none of those bring the kind of hope and wisdom that we need for Babylon. Not not military power. I know we think, man, if we could just fix things with China and get Ukraine and Russia settled, like if we could just do that, we're the most powerful military in the world, then I could be at peace. Then I could be at rest. Then I could be at home in America. Will never give us, the military might of our country will never give us the hope and wisdom we need. Our political power 2024 is coming up. Are you guys ready? It's going to be a great time. Get ready for it's the most important election ever. And can we, as we ramp up, guard our hearts? Can we guard our hearts against the rhetoric of Babylon that tells you your hope lies in political power? It does not. It never has, and it never will. See, the issue of life in Babylon, for God's people to bring Jerusalem to bear, to be faithful to both assimilate and resist, the issue of life in Babylon is who is the source of our lives? Who is the source of our lives? Now, As we wind up this morning, you may think, 
I need more. This world is complex, and what I'm trying to navigate is hard. Can you give me five principles? Wisdom, complexity and wisdom resist often bottom-lining things to principles. For God's people, it's actually an issue of dependence, of trusting the source of life in the midst of that complexity. Times are difficult. Times are confusing. And what it means to be a faithful Christian in America and in California is shifting rapidly. But can I say this, that in the incarnation of Jesus, we have both our hope and our wisdom. He is the perfect embodiment of conformity and resistance. Daniel was sent to Babylon to seek its welfare. So Jesus was sent to earth to seek our welfare, your welfare, my welfare. Jesus came and he lived fully present in the kingdoms of Babylon. He was at parties. He reclined at the table with sinners and tax collectors. He wept and laughed and sang and slept and danced. He was fully present. And just as Daniel resisted fully assimilating into Babylon, so Christ resisted fully assimilating by refusing to draw his life from any other place other than his father. I will not look to Babylon as my source of life. He didn't look to military might or political power or human cunning and wisdom. He knew where his life came from. He knew what sustained him. So the question for us as we begin this series, and the question for us this morning as we navigate our own Babylon, is where will we find our life? Where are we looking for life? From whose table will we draw our sustenance as we live in Babylon? Maybe you're still thinking, where do I start? I don't even know where to start to live this out. I don't know how to do this. Every week, every single week, we do this with great purpose and intentionality. Every week we come to the table because as we do we are doing as Daniel did. We are embodying faithful resistance in Babylon. With our bodies, we get up, we walk to the table to receive from the true king, from the one who is the sustainer of our lives. We are saying, Christ is my source of life in Babylon. No matter how things look, I will trust you as my source. That's the invitation to us this morning. Let's pray. God, thank you that you are our source of life. God, it's so easy to look to the extravagance of Babylon, to the power of Babylon, to the might of Babylon for our hope, for our peace, for our rest, for our wisdom. But God, how weak Babylon is compared to the greatness of our God. Lord, help us remember the narrative of Shinar, that we could live lives in Babylon fully present, yet resisting, because you are our life, our hope, our peace. Thank you that we're invited to the table this morning where we can do as Daniel did and refuse to eat from the king's table. We can eat from the true king's table, the source of life. 
Jesus Christ. Thank you that you meet your people this morning here in Babylon. In the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Amen.